Hello and welcome back to Unfazed Under Fire. I'm David Craigotts, your host and moderator for the show. And this show aims to support executives in strengthening their impact and resilience in the face of these crazy times we find ourselves in. And our stand on this show is that human beings have all the resources, resourcefulness they need within them to rise and address the biggest challenges we face. Now to gain access to these resources requires an executive or an individual to spend time turning a bit inward to get to know, know themselves a bit better, what they care about most, and really what kind of unique brand of leadership they want to express. By doing so, they walk the path of really self-mastery, which is supercharges their leadership impact, strengthens their resilience, and deepens their personal fulfillment. Now, I also want to extend deep appreciation for all the great feedback we've been getting on Unfazed Under Fire. The positive, that positive reflects back on the amazing guests I've had the opportunity to interview, and I'm grateful for them as well. And if you're new to us, welcome to the show. Finally, if you find this podcast helpful and insightful, I just ask that you share it with other people through whatever means you have through social media or whatever. Now, today we have another incredible guest, Walt Rakovich. And I was referred to Walt through a longtime client and who has become a good friend, Stuart Brown. And I'm grateful uh, for that introduction. So shout out to Stuart. Now, Walt has had a stellar career. Uh, he cut his teeth in business through his accounting, through the accounting profession at PricewaterhouseCoopers, was a partner commercial real estate firm Trammell and Crow for close to 10 years, and served as a CEO of Prologis, which he calls his crucible moment. And we'll be talking a little bit about that. But when he was the head of Prologis, the company was facing some major challenges. His stock price had dropped from $70 to $2. Ouch. <laughs> and through your leadership, you turned that company around and oversaw a successful merger with AMB in 2012. I got that right. Yeah. And since then, you've been serving on a number of boards, including host hotels and resorts, uh, Iron Mountain, where uh, you and I know Stuart from, and the World Bank, uh, World Food Bank. And you're also a prolific speaker, and you wrote a book, became a published author in 2020. Congratulations on that, which focuses on uh, for which is on transforma transformative influence, and that supports executives to be more effectively lead and succeed in the face of this world's rapidly changing and chaotic environment. Um, and you emphasize in that book the importance of humility, honesty, and heart, which I really value myself. Now, I've watched a couple of your interviews, and I can tell, Walt, that you come from uh, a deep sense of integrity and a deep passion for the subject of servant leadership. And on a personal front, you live in Colorado. Uh, you spent your winter months in Florida every year. I don't know if you've moved down there yet or not. <laughs> well, uh, we live there five months out of the year down in Maine. Oh, great. And you do that with your wife, Sue, and you have a son and daughter. And I understand you have a fairly new recent member of your family and a granddaughter from your daughter. I do. So congr belated congratulations on that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and thanks for joining us today. Did I leave anything out or anything you wanted to mention before we jump in? And yeah, great. Really good well, job. yeah, good. Well, I, you know, your book and Transfluence, your book entitled Transfluence, uh, was kind of grounded in a crucible moment. And I know you've told this story a zillion times. So I want to, uh, you know, ask you to do it again and, and talk about your experience at Prologis and how this became a crucible moment for you. And if you could, I don't know if you can break it down into chapters in that experience. I know you, I remember in one of the interviews you said you walked in the first day and you really didn't know what you were, you, you kind of, you accepted a job, but at, in the back of your mind, you weren't sure how you were gonna approach the situation. Um, that's, that's, and that's a human, that's a human reality, right? A lot of times we don't know. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not gonna be effective. Uh, but if you could just share a little bit about that story to get us started as a foundation to talk uh, to the rest of the interview. Yeah, I, I will. Let me yeah, I kind of set the stage. I, I had been, well, first of all, for those of your listeners that aren't familiar with Prologis, um, it's mm -hmm. a fortune 500 company. Um, the company has over $150 billion of assets. One of the two or three oh. largest real estate companies in the world. And it focuses, it's really the largest owner of industrial real estate, Fair, fairly basic. We own warehouses. Um, yeah. we, we build some of them and we, um, acquire some of them, but basically we're in the business of owning warehouses and leasing it. And, you know, I had been with the company um, at this time, um, taking over as CEO for about 15 years prior to that. And I was in various positions, uh, regional vice president and, you know, CFO, 
president, chief operating officer. And over all my years, we had a very sound, you know, sound strategy, great people. We were really a darling on Wall Street in the early years. Um, and I think all of that was a result of, of great leadership. But something when I became president, chief operating officer, which was the number two person in the company, something sort of changed. Um, we went through a change of leadership. Uh, there was a new CEO uh, who I reported to, and um, and frankly, truly one of the smartest people I've ever, ever met in my life. Um, um, you know, and and you know had many really good qualities, but I, I struggled with um, sort of reconciling with him what good leadership meant. And the fact of the matter is, in most pa- uh, cases, people don't leave companies; they leave bosses. Yes, and that's true. You've probably heard yeah. that before. And I, I've seen I, it happen. <laughs> yeah. So on, on the yeah. one hand, I'm, I, I have a boss who I, I truly respect from a uh, brilliance perspective, truly one of the smartest guys you ever, you ever want to meet. And on the other hand, I frankly, uh, David, I felt marginalized by um, his need to look brilliant. Um, and, and, you know, um, the management team and I all felt that many times we didn't feel listened to, uh, many times we didn't feel trusted. Many times we feel felt like we didn't agree, but weren't you know weren't listened to, and 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 frankly we weren't being told told the truth, um, and and I could see our culture changing. Um, we began to act in silos, you know we didn't communicate as much with one another, um, and we didn't talk in the open about things. Decisions were made behind closed doors in some cases, and we made poor investment decisions and. And we put too much debt on our balance sheet at the end of the day. And even despite the fact that we didn't all agree about it and hold hands as a management team. And in the end, frankly, those those um, decisions cost the company dearly going into the Great Recession in 2008. And though I had no idea that the Great Recession was coming, I had a, a, a discussion with the board and I basically told the board I thought that the CEO, my boss, was running us over a cliff and I didn't want to be a part of it. And uh, it was a really tough, deci- uh, tough decision and tough conversation with the board. Um, and so I resigned in January of 2008, right on the precipice of the Great Recession. And our stock, as you mentioned, was at an all time high. It was at seventy two dollars a share, which equated to a market cap of, I don't know, twenty five or so billion dollars. Wow. So it was a reasonably sized company even back then. And from the outside looking in, we looked great. But from the inside looking yeah. out, we were a disaster waiting to happen. And and I, I left in January and February and March, the stock had fallen to 60 and then April it's at 50 and then by June it's at 40 and so forth and so on. By September it's at, it's at 10 and by October it's at five and hits November 2nd and the stock hits $2.20 wow. a share. That's crazy. And, um, and I'm watching this from the sidelines and the, the board calls me up and said, well, um, we were going to part ways with the CEO. You were right. And we need you to come back and run the company. And, and, and by the way, the Prologis at that point was the third worst performing stock in the S and P 500 year to date. Um, we were down 95%. Um, and the, the, the wall street journal did a front page article on us about how we were going bankrupt. And it was a, it was a sorry time. And, and so I knew it would take a Herculean effort. I really did. I was scared to death. I actually didn't know how I was going to turn around the company. Um, I really didn't. I knew I had a great management team, but I also had hired a lot of the people that were there. And, and, uh, you know, I kind of thought about it and I I said, you know, I I just can't walk away from this. I got to do it. And even though I didn't want to spend the next three years of my life turning around a bankrupt company, I, I just somehow had this feeling we could do it. Um, and you know what? Crucible moments, as you mentioned, are sometimes the best opportunities that we have to shine, even though we would never, ever wish them upon our, anybody our, else, anybody, anybody else. else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so over the next four years, and we're going to talk about this, I know. And so I won't go into details, but on, over the next four years, I learned what leadership meant. Um, and and, you know, and, and frankly, I was never so aware of how my actions would be magnified as the day I took over a near public company. And when I say magnified, I mean, everybody was watching everything that I did. Um, So leadership mattered. 
And many of those things that I write about in Transfluence really came out of uh, that crucible moment of, of coming back to Prologis at that point in time. So, you, you, you know, I, I would assume that, you know, what you said about like you're a little, you're uh, disconnect with the former CEO around the, the style of leadership that you had a sense of the kind of leadership it would take. But you also intimated that something deepened in you in this experience as you took on this uh, scared as hell or what are scared to death or whatever, walking into this thing, everybody's looking at you. What was what 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 transformed in Walt through this process? In other words, what deepened in you as you went through the process? Because I think that to me, a, a lot of times we look at leadership and there's like, you know, if you look on Amazon, there's 15, 17,000 books on the subject. You know, everybody's told to read a book a month on leadership. Uh, wow. But you and I, but you and I both know that intellectual understanding of leadership does very little when you're in the fire, that something yep. else has to emerge from within you. Uh, so, so if you're given that, what, what, if you could speak to it a little bit, what occurred within Walt that changed that had him meet the day? If you could speak to that a little bit. I came to the realization that it wasn't about me. And, uh, and, and if you, and yeah. if you look at, if you read Transfluence, the book, yeah. um, and and I know we'll talk a little bit about it, but the premise of the book is leadership is not about you. Yes. And, I think, and I really believe that if leaders grasp that, it puts them in a position to all of a sudden listen to other people, um, gather information around them. I mean, when you come to work and you think you've got all the answers, then you, that's when you find out that you don't, and generally speaking, you fail. But if you come to the work, if you come to work with the, the notion that it's not about you, but as a leader, it is about the influence that you can have on other people. Um, and, and, and if you come to work with that idea in mind, you can be open to so many things around you. And I needed it because the truth of the matter is, David, I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have right. it. I, I knew I didn't, and I was actually put in a fairly vulnerable position um, to, in essence, have to lean on other people. And um, and so as I look back on, on reading, or, or, excuse me, writing the book, tra uh, Transfluence stands for Transformational Influence. influence what does that right. mean? It means that leadership is about making a transformational influence in the lives of other people. But in order to do that, as you were talking about in the beginning, you got to put yourself in the position where it's not about you, but it is about everybody else around you. And when you start leading that way, I think you can make a tremendous difference in, in your company and in the lives of the people that you lead. Well, and I think a, a lot of what you say in the book, or you intimate in the book, and uh, you know, I, I scanned through it. I didn't read it in detail, so I might have missed some of the stories, but one of the things, the essential nature of how do you build trust? Right. Yeah. And, and that is the foundation of influence, trust and respect, mutual trust and respect is a foundation of influence, as I say. Uh, what did you have as you look into people knew you, you walked into the business, uh, but at the same time, the business was in a certain state. What did you have to do when you were in that position to begin to build that trust, either leverage the trust you had, deepen it or build it with some others that may have doubt, maybe they doubted that it was going to be able to be turned around, et cetera. Yeah. So I talk about in the book, I talk, I talk about fourth, you know, when you write a book, you always, it, 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 yeah, it causes yeah, because, you to sit back and, and say to yourself, okay, what was I really thinking at that time? Right. Yeah, 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 and yeah. then how do I write yeah. this down? But, um, you know, I, I talk about four things and, and we'll probably from time to time in this interview, go through the four, but well, let me give you kind of the four pillars from my perspective. I think the first thing is, um, you got to get out of your own way, as I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is about recognizing that there are demons for any leader. And those demons are two, twofold, uh, two primary demons, pride and fear. And I mm -hmm. hope we can talk a little bit more and dig into that. But for now, yeah. let me keep it at 30,000 feet. Right. Um, I, I really believe that uh, the two greatest demons that leaders face are pride and fear, either their hubristic pride uh, about themselves and their abilities, or their fear, which causes insecurity, which causes leaders to do things that aren't good. Um, so 
I, I think it's important for leaders first and foremost to reflect a little bit and and to re really try to understand themselves. I talk in the book about the importance of getting coaching. I think coaching is really, really important for any leader. Um, to have somebody to tell you what other people really think of you is something that you don't know. And, um, and you will learn a lot from. The second thing is in this world that we live in today, we live in a world that is moving much more rapidly than it moved 30 years ago. Yep, and, um, absolutely. Transparency and communication are so critically important in this world. I think the world demands from leaders today, and perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about this too, but the world demands from leaders today a higher level of, of communication and transparency than it ever did in the past. And so if you want to build trust in the organization, A, you got to get out of your own way, and B, you got to start communicating and be very transparent. The third thing, let's just call it a pillar, is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned in the beginning about the three H's. I, I hope that I have a chance to tell the story about John Mack, who was the CEO of Morgan Stanley and I, and he mentored me and he, um, he talked to me about the three H's, the importance of the three H's. And the three H's to me are humility, honesty, and That's humanness, easy. right? And, and those things are that they, they create authenticity in people. And the fourth thing is purpose. I think, I think leaders have to actually point their people in a direction that provides them with purpose. Meaning and purpose in life are so critically important. It's important for your employees not, to under, not just to understand where the company is going, but how their jobs fit into that in a company. And I think if you can provide, you know, get, get out of your own way, if you can be transparent, communicate, if you can be authentic, um, and if you can provide purpose to your employees, those things are critically important in building trust. And let yeah. me tell you one more thing. Trust, in my view, is the currency of business. Uh, yes, people yes. talk about dollars. No, it's not dollars. Trust. It's not euros. It's trust. Okay. And yeah. without trust, you got nothing. With trust, you got everything. And that's what and leaders ought to be thinking about. How do I build trust in my organization? If I build trust, then I, you know, I can take on anything. And I found that at Prologis um, in the deepest and darkest moments. Yeah. And also trust if you know, like if you are in a situation where you have trust, if you if you make a decision that loses and erodes that trust, it's yeah. so much hard to get it back to the oh, degree yeah. that you had it before that decision, right? So you have to be very mindful of that is the currency. I love that because that is fundamentally the foundation for everything else is possible because fundamentally we're a collective group of people working together, hopefully collaboratively towards the vision or goals that we're, we're trying to address. And you can't have collaboration without trust. So the whole thing breaks apart. That's know? right. And, and, and back to your point, you can lose trust in a second. You can never build trust in a second. Yeah, it takes time. It takes, it takes, it takes time to build trust. And unfortunately, when you lose it, you've lost it for a while, maybe yeah. forever. Yeah. Well, I want to go, I want to start, uh, point to a couple of those gremlins you meant, which are pride and fear. But I want to get to those and I went through a couple questions uh, and then dig into that a little bit deeper. Uh, yeah. You, first of all, you talk about the dis difference between traditional leadership versus transformational yeah. leadership. So maybe yeah. that would be a good way to set the stage a little bit. And I want to talk about what you think is the current status of this kind of transformational leadership in the world, in the corporate world specifically today, just to get your assessment on that and say what's what I think is holding people that back from growing more is those two very things that you mentioned. Yeah. So if you could talk a little bit about how you distinguish traditional from transformational leadership. Okay, so, you know, um, David, when I took my job, my first job in 1979 coming out of college, this will take you way back, right? Um, and it was, as you said, it was with PW Price Waterhouse at the time. It was traditional command and control leadership. Yes. And, um, I was happy to be employed. Um, leadership, um, my bosses paid little attention to our culture, very little attention. I can tell you that. Um, and, and frankly, we didn't care either. No one was talking about culture back then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, leadership was really granted to those who had done their time. Not yeah. necessarily merit based that had done their time, not necessarily those who know, knew how to manage either. Uh, it was those that understand uh, absolutely. It was those that understood the accounting profession the best, and their positions 
were more secure and people were less critical or vocal of management and what management had to say. And so my job, as I, as I look at that, my job was more transactional at that point in time, i.e. I was going there, I was gonna be there for a period of time, I was gonna collect a paycheck, I was gonna learn as much as I could learn and they needed a job done and I needed a paycheck. And I was fine with that and they were fine with that and I had no questions as to what my leadership would be <laughs> would be about. I just wanted to gain experience, and that was it. And I really believed that that was that was work, and they yeah, knew a lot yeah. more than I do. I, I did. Right, right, right. Let me tell you, today the world is just so different. Um, and completely different. And, yeah. and don't get me wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna paint a picture for you that I know took place during a draconian time when I took over as CEO. But when I took over as CEO. Um, on the first day of work, and, and again, this is a company that's going bankrupt, but I received over a thousand emails, calls, texts from the world, Every, everybody from bond investors, equity investors, sell side analysts, rating agencies, the mayor of Denver, news publishers, <laughs> social media outlets, okay, you name it. And by the way, they weren't asking me questions, they were demanding that I answer their questions, okay? Online chats. We're rampant talking about our future and my ability to manage. And I could read them and our employees wanted answers quickly. Okay. Let me tell you, we live in a world of greater access to information. We live in a world with more diverse people who think differently. Uh, we live in a world where people live in different geographies and, and, and progress is accelerating every day. Technology is yes. accelerating. And I call them in my book climates. They are climates of change. Yes. And, and I think they, on one hand, create tremendous opportunities for people um, to, from a technological perspective, to become efficient. But on the other hand, you try to lead during this time. And I'm telling you what, because we all live in, we live in glass houses. And when I say that, I say that in a book, it, the whole world can see what you're doing. OK, there is no hiding and you have to be transparent. You have to communicate. You have to be aware of the fact that people think differently all around you and they have elevated expectations because they see you more. They understand you more. Um, I think they do at least. And I think it requires it requires from leadership a more constant drumbeat of transparency and communication. I think it requires leaders that lead with values based leadership and where leaders lead by example and because they can see everybody can see what you're doing and criticize you for everything. And I think leaders have to enforce the human element um, oh and, and, and therefore they have to be more empathetic. They have to be they have to recognize, give credit to more. Uh, they have to be more balanced. They have to articulate a purpose for people. Um, really wave the flag and say, this is where we're going. And um, they got to convince people that they are moving down the right path where they didn't have to convince anybody before. They were right in the eyes of the world before. Right, they weren't right, exactly. right in the eyes of the world today. Uh, we live in a very critical world and, yes. and we just do. And it's a very, very difficult world. So when you ask me about differences in leadership, compare and contrast, I think many years ago, it was all about command and control and the strongest at the top one. I think today it is about, um, it, it is completely different. I think the human element is important. Transparency, communication is important. You need a leader that can do a lot more than just pound the table and say, this is it. It's my way or the highway. I think that's where we are today. Yeah, I mean, and I think that you're, you're pointing to like, if you make it about you, then you're just gonna be taking a lot of painful darts and it's going Absolutely. to hurt when you make it about you. Those darts are going to hurt when you make it about the other situation. They may sting a little bit, but you're taking it for the team. You're taking you're you 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 emphasizing that transparency with your team to move things forward. Uh, you're building a different kind of relationship with those internally yep. uh, and and et cetera. So, uh, you know, and, and then if if you look at the corporate, I'm just curious about your assessment because you sit on a lot of boards. You you have a good vantage point of corporate America. Yeah. You know, I've been in the leadership development profession for 27 years. I've seen a lot of changes, uh, and I've seen a lot of investment in leadership too. 
<clears throat> I've been a yeah. part of it. I mean, I've actually did partner development at PwC. I think after they learned their some of their lessons, they recognizing that they had to had to help their partners a little bit. Um, what is you? What is your point of view of the current state of corporate America and its ability to create an environment of servant leadership and empowering uh, cultures that create value and foster high performance and accountability and bring out the best in other? How how do you think we're doing in a scorecard with moving in that direction of having that be a more prevalent way of leading and building organizations? You know, this might surprise you, but and I, I sit on the, the board of three public companies as you mentioned. I just came mm -hmm. off of the board of my uh, my university. And I would actually tell you that I'm more encouraged today than than ever before. And I say that from and don't get me wrong, I don't I'm not looking at the world through rose colored glasses, but yeah. notwithstanding the rhetoric out there, and you have to you have to remember that what we read about every day in social media or what we read about or listen to in the news, uh, it's it's all the negative stuff. I mean, that's what that is. I mean, people don't you know, they don't make money, unfortunately, by publishing positive things. Yeah, it's um, unfortunate. And so I, what I see in the boardroom is this. I think we have more in-depth discussions as board members today about employee development, about corporate culture. We spend time in every single board meeting talking about those things, uh, about employee retention. I think there's more encouragement and in fact, I would I would even say that there's more acceptance towards engagement surveys, um, employee engagement surveys. What are they saying? Um, employee well-being. I think there's more discussion about medical and emotional um, assistance. And actually, I think there's more willingness, um, or I should even say acceptance, towards coaching um, at the senior levels of organizations to try to learn how they should not only how they should lead better, but what do people think of that? You know, how are they leading and what do they need to do to make changes midstream to that? Um, I see millennials and Gen Z employees, which now make up over 75% of the workforce. And um, I, I, I think that they are less sensitive to, um, um, and, and yeah, less sensitive to bad leadership um, today. If they don't like the leader, they'll leave. And there's yes. a war. There's a war in talent yeah. out there. That I mean, we only have three percent unemployment. Come on, it was different when I was in 1979. It was like nine to ten percent unemployment. Right, exactly. Employers, employers had all the leverage. Now I think employees have much more leverage. And and then then you have this whole ESG movement, which we can argue about. You know whether or not it's gone too far one way or another. But there's so much more focus on governance and social. Um, mm -hmm. Let's put the environmental aside, just the, the governance and social aspect of, of organizations. How are we governing ourselves? What are we doing for the social well being of our company, which always relates to employees? Um, let me tell you, when I first went on the board at Prologis, and this is God, I mean, this is, um, I don't know, 20 year, over 20 years ago, we weren't having these discussions at the board meeting. We weren't. We, I mean, we just weren't. Yeah. It, 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 it just wasn't taboo. Today, you have to have these discussions. You absolutely have to. And, and so I wouldn't necessarily call it a movement, um, but I do think that there's more attention being paid to good leadership today, what good leadership looks like, which is not to say that we don't have a bunch of bad leaders out there. We certainly still right. have them and we always will. But I think there's a lot more attention today being paid to it. And and so therefore it's encouraging to me um, kind of in the long run. Yeah, I would agree. There's there's progress, certainly not perfection, but we're moving in, yeah. the, in the right direction. And I, I think what you speak to is leaders having to face these two gremlins of pride and fear within themselves. I, I you know, you, you have, to me, as I look at, um, you know, the research shows we have a very, also a very traumatized society for various reasons. Uh, you know, I grew up in the in the time of Dr. Spock being the the, the head of uh, how parents should parent, and he yeah. didn't really do any justice to uh, those growing up at the time. Where parents took that seriously, but we have we have people that are uh, I, I say that you know, and they they show up in the executive suite too. So, yeah. and what I'm saying, what I'm pointing to is like in when you are in such a spotlight, you're in that glass house. Uh, the survival mechanism is you're not your best friend. 
You know, it's good when you have, you're facing a saber tooth tiger if they would face that or a bear or you've got a fire in your house. It's good to have the survival mechanism in place, but it also kicks in at those times when it feels dangerous. It may not be dangerous, but it feels dangerous. It and, the, and pride and fear is always wants to reach in and yeah. be your friend at the wrong time. Right? Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. I, I couldn't yeah, agree yeah. with you more. You know, I, I, I write about this. I believe I wrote about this in the book. I don't remember if I found this afterward or not. But um, there's, uh, there was a, a, a survey that was done by Harvard Business Review many years ago. Um, and it, it's called, What Are CEOs Afraid Of? And um, they, they interviewed over 100 C-suite executives, not all CEOs, but a lot of them. And they asked them what their biggest fears were. Okay. Now you would have thought that these people, you know, being at the top of the heap would have said, well, it's my competition or it's losing good people, you know, or maybe it's my financial well-being. I know we got to, we've got to refinance the balance sheet or we got to, you know, we got to get up to get liquidity and, you know, those sort of external things. No, you know what the number one fear was, David? Incompetence. The number one fear that C-suite executives had was incompetence, which is their own incompetence, their own, yeah. the, the fear of being wrong. Okay. Yeah. Not having the right answer. And CEOs right. talked about how it led to them being dictatorial, um, not listening because they wanted to be right. And yeah. so they, they just the opposite. They, they did the opposite thing. And that is to shut people off. Um, right. The second one, was underachievement, okay? A fear of not doing enough because their competitor was going to do more. And, and so the CEOs talked about how they felt like that might have led to the lack of discipline. Um, and in my case, in the real estate business, that means overpaying for assets because yeah. if you don't, your competitor will. Um, I saw that firsthand at Prologis. And, and the third fear, and I won't go through the five, but the third fear was appearing vulnerable. <laughs> vulnerable the fear of either not being important or not being relevant and ceos talked about how that led to a lack of delegation why because they wanted to hoard everything right they yes. wanted to keep all yes. the information right and again here you go not listening to people and that's what i'm talking about because you're right when you're in the glass house you get protective of yourself right and and when you begin to get protective your insecurities begin to surround you and those insecurities begin to take over. And that is the absolute wrong thing to do. And it's yeah. a knee jerk reaction, but it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, then you start taking actions that actually, as you say, counter what you're trying to accomplish by yeah. holding your closed chart, chart close to your chest, by screaming at people, by whatever, of not being transparent. Um, well, it, it, and as far as, you know, you look at, uh, what do boards need to keep in mind with that as they're hiring CEOs? How do you hire for that uh, being resolved? Or how do you hire for heart and humility and and uh, transparency and all the thing, great things you talk about? You know, do you think board, I'm sure, I'm hearing that you think, I think probably there's more attention going on those things, but what is something, you know, as a board member that you've seen people struggle with that you say that this would be helpful if people, you know, frame this a little differently? and how we're hiring top executives in our organizations? You know, that is a really good question because um, sometimes those things are hard to find. I mean, obviously when you're, you know, if you're hiring a C-suite executive, you really need to do your due diligence. Um, you need mm -hmm. to talk to as many people and ask those questions of as many people as you can. I think you need to run um, certain tests. Um, you know, personality tests can help a lot in that. And a lot of companies don't do that. Um, the best companies, yeah. The best companies do do that. I think you, um, you know, when you're hiring uh, a C-level executive, is well, you're hiring anybody. I the first one of the first things I look for is listening skills. Are they really listening to me, or do they want to tell me about what they what they want to do? And um, I think you know the, the 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 best leaders of the world are the best listeners. I at least I find. Um, That's true. And, yeah, and, I don't think um, a truer thing could be said. That's my no. experience. And so you look for all those things. There's, there's, there's just a litany of things. And I think it's also important as a board to have your listing of things that are important to you. What is important in your business? If you're a service business, 
capital allocation may not be important. If you're a real estate business, capital allocation is critical. And so there's those sorts of competency kind of things. That Absolutely, that's critical. The technical uh, skills critical. of that particular industry. Right. What you pointed to is we don't run these personality tests. And I think there was some high percentage of sociopath and narcissistic personalities that tend to get those position because they're really good at schmoozing and, yeah. and confidently influencing the board. And if, you, if you're buying into that, uh, you're actually buying into the very thing that's going to cause you problems <laughs> when you hire them because that, that's what they do. And then they don't necessarily have a, a full cup underneath that, right? Uh, well, right. Especially right. when troubles happens. So I think it's really important that organizations start taking a look at the neuroatypical people that can come in and actually be very good at influencing in a particular way, which I want to talk to you about a distinction. There are certain different kinds of influence, different ways of influencing, right? There's charismatic influence and, you know, ability to kind of, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean charismatic means that, but it can. Uh, and then there's other, there's a deeper sense of influence, which I think you're pointing to and transfluence. So, you know, that's yeah. important. But uh, uh, the so anyway, so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Is, is you're the distinction in different level because the influence is this broad word. I want to, I need to influence without authority. I need to be a better influencer. And organizations have different definitions about that. And maybe you've already spoken about it and you can bring me back to that. But what is, what is the best kind of influence in your mind? And what does it take to be that kind of influencer? Well, that's a really good question. And obviously everybody's a little bit different, but I'm going to get to, and I referred to this earlier, I'm going to get to a conversation that I had with John Mack, who was a CEO of Morgan yeah. Stanley. And now keep Please. in mind, keep in mind what in 2008, I'm taking over and the stock market's down 40%. Um, everybody is going bankrupt, supposedly. Remember, Goldman Sachs was rumored to be going bankrupt, as was Morgan Stanley. And um, we were too. And um, I had an investment banker friend of mine who said, Walt, I, I really want you to talk to uh, John Mack, who's our CEO, he, he'd like to talk to you. You're a big client. Um, and I said, sure, let's do that. So I get on the line with John and, and and John was pretty much revered in the investment banking business as being truly one of the better leaders because, you know, banking business doesn't produce tremendous uh, leaders with, um, you know, empathy and EQ and all that <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. John, John was that kind of leader. And I said to him, I said, the first question I said, John, I want to ask you a question. I said, you know, during this time of difficulty internally, um, what do you look for in people? Number one. And number two, like, what do you, you know, wh what, what drives you as a leader? What do you think your, you know, your best qualities are and, um, and people need the most today. And he's like, well, I manage, I look for people and I manage people on the basis of the three H's, which you, you referred to before and that's a basic tenet of my book and i say i said wow john what do you mean by the three h's and he said <laughs> he said walt the best leaders you will ever meet are leaders that are humble they're honest and he said in this day and age a banker needs to have a sense of humor and i sort of laughed at that and he said see you see what i mean <laughs> and um, and i said well, that's interesting. And I kind of took that and I went home and dwelled on it for a little while. And um, I couldn't get my arms or a little bit around that much around humor because I didn't really view myself as being a humorous person, although I could crack a joke from time to time. But I think what he really meant was that humor fell underneath this broader word, which is being human. Um, yeah. That people, whenever you, you walk into a room, people have to see you as being a human being that they can relate to um, right. that actually cares about them. cares. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so people ask me all the time, well, what do you mean by those three words? Cause you know, I, I got to tell you, if you look at, you look humility up in Webster's dictionary, um, you'll read stuff like weak, um, unassertive. Yeah, it's terrible. It's you'll terrible. Yeah. Terrible stuff. Not, say, not, not understood. Not well understood. Yeah. Yeah. You'll say, David, I don't want to be that kind of leader. Right. There's absolutely no way. Right. But, I don't think I think real humility takes amazing amount of courage. And I think it's not about being weak, but it's about accepting that you have weaknesses. And by the way, being willing to admit them from time to time. Yeah. Um, you know, honesty is another one. It's like everybody thinks they're honest, except for the fact that few leaders are really comfortable with bad news. 
and they're real honest with good news. The bad news, uh, I don't know that I'm going to talk that much about it. And yeah. By the way, you're somewhat dishonest just by, by virtue of the fact that you won't talk about it. Um, right, exactly. And, uh, you know, sometimes silence is not golden. And, and, and then this word humanity. I mean, humanity is about empowering people, listening to people, lifting them up, recognizing them, realizing that you're the conductor in the orchestra, not the soloist. You know, yes. you don't have to be the soloist. You just conduct it. And, and, and all you have to do is make people feel better about themselves and feel great about what they're doing. And, you know, that's to me what real leadership is about. Now, you might say that's the soft side of leadership. But I had the CEO of the largest, one of the largest investment banks, banks period in the world, telling say me, that. oh, that's how you have to lead. Right. And and so. I'm not telling you something because I'm a soft guy. I'm telling you something because I believe it's proven and I believe that people have come to the realization that's how you manage people today. Well, quite frankly, that, that is also a touchstone of traditional to transformational leadership, right? And quite frankly, as, uh, you know, I recently had a podcast guest on, who, uh, Eric Harkins, who wrote a book, uh, How to... Uh, be great leaders, make sure Monday mornings don't suck. You know, that was the <laughs> title, title of his book. And it's a really good book, actually. Highly recommend it. So he calls it a two, uh, two glass of wine read. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, the, but the, you know, in, in this whole thing is that he mentioned, and I agree with this, I've said this all the time, when you become an executive, you just, your job just became easier, not more hard. Individual contributors have the hard job. But if but if but if you think it's on your shoulders, it's the most difficult job in the world. Yes. Right. But if you're facilitating from a point of view of I don't know everything, here's the problem. I know we have to solve that problem. Let me bring the right people around and let's talk honestly about the good, bad and the ugly of that and come up with a solution. You're fundamentally facilitating brilliance around you to and in and, and probably a high percentage of the cases, the solution is not coming from you. Right. Oh, in, in a high, high uh, number of cases. In fact, I can can I tell you a quick story about that? Yeah. Um, I, I think that um, vulnerability is actually the most one of the most difficult things that a leader can do. It is very difficult um, for all of us in a certain way. <laughs> we all face out. <laughs> yet it can be one of the most powerful tools. Yes, because yes. it's human and, and it's the ultimate expression of honesty and transparency. And so this happened to me and I I, uh, I did write about this in my book. And maybe you've heard this story, but your audience likely hasn't. Um, so I had, um, I had taken over the company and I had been in the job for maybe a month and a half. And I was worried the company was on, on the verge of bankruptcy. And I had a, a, a meeting, it was after midnight, and we were working dog years. And I, I met with my finance team after midnight. There are about 10 people in the room. And one of the financial people in the organization said, Walt, I've got some bad news for you. And I said, oh, boy, what's that? And he said, well, I think we're going to blow our bond covenants um, in the month of January. And uh, we had about, I think we had between 8 and $10 billion of bonds outstanding. And once, and a couple of them were cross-collateralized in that if you blew one covenant and one, it, 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 it hurt you on the other. And, um, and basically, we weren't going to meet our income test in order to keep our bonds outstanding. And so I looked around the room and I said, well, what does this mean, guys? And everybody looked at me and said, well, well we don't see any way around it. We're probably going to have to declare bankruptcy. So my face got white as a ghost, David, and I didn't know what to do. OK, and so I walked. I said, guys, do you mind if I just take a break? And they're like, no, well, go ahead. So I took off and I walked down the hallway and I felt like I was going to faint. And in fact, um, when I felt like I was going to faint, I saw this chair that was not too far in the distance and I beelined to the chair to try to get to it to sit down. And unfortunately, I didn't make it. And on my way down fainting, I hit my head on the corner of the guy's desk, empty desk, and and um, was laying in a what turned out to be a pool of blood for about 10 minutes as my, as oh my, my head, head was bleeding. Okay, And it's dark outside. And finally, I come to my senses and I wake up and I see... 
that it's dark outside and literally for about 30 seconds didn't know where I was. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh my God, I'm the CEO of this company, I'm running it and there's 10 people in the room waiting for me to come back um, as to what we're gonna do. So I quickly, oh I, went, I went to the bathroom, I sutured up my head, I got it to stop bleeding. I had this god awful lump on my head and I come into the uh, room and everybody's looking at me and they go, well, so, so are you okay? And I go, yeah, I'm fine. And I said, you know, so let's talk about this, this bankruptcy issue. Let's not use the word bankrupt. Let's make it call it the B issue or something. And, and my CFO looks at me and he said, well, no, Walt, let's talk about that god awful lump on your head. What happened to you? <laughs> and I remember looking around the room and I, I said, you know what, guys? I was hired into this job to keep us up from going bankrupt. I said, you guys just use the B word. I have absolutely no idea what to do. And you, you should see the look on everybody's faces and look around the room, you know, looking for answers. And, and, and one person, and I can't remember who it was said, well, let us, let us handle this. We got your back. Okay. And you know what? We came up with an answer within 30 days as to what we were going to do that, that kept the lights on and kept us out of bankruptcy. And it would take me too long to explain it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It had to do with the sale of our business in China and the sale of partially our business in Japan, which created earnings to um, give us some runway. But the one thing that I realized is, well, two things. One is the power of vulnerability as a leader. Not always. I think sometimes if you do it too much, actually people might wonder why you're leading. In the right, right, exactly. But at the, the appropriate time, it can be a very powerful tool. And the second thing is, I think by letting your guard down, you invite others to do the same. And that's where real yeah. communication happens in organizations, is when people feel free and liberated to say the things that they need to and want to say. And I think part of that was just coming across to them like, you know, I was part of them. I wasn't some guy that was sitting in an ivory tower that had all the answers. And in fact, I was looking to them to produce the answers. And I think that that was really powerful for me starting off as, as uh, the CEO of the company. Well, all three H's apply there, right? And that uh, you know, you weren't thinking about that when you're walking in the room and they asked that question. You wow. just came up with you just were, this is my answer. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I I really love this conversation and appreciate everything you're saying about you know this movement towards this kind of leadership and and the, and the need for it. Uh, I can't help but look out at the world today and wonder sometimes. I think and I do do believe, as you were pointing to earlier, that this is, you know, progress, not perfection, but we are making progress and business leaders are showing up. And I've had the great fortune of coaching some, interviewing many, meeting many through the course of my networking and uh, building relationships and so forth. Yeah. And I, sometimes I wonder if like, you know, and we pre-World War II, we had the George Pattons and the Eisenhowers being developed at war colleges uh, that saved our butt in World War II. And I sometimes wonder if the crisis is, that is emerging in our world right now is not going to be uh, potentially saved by, well, by leaders who have actually been in the fire in business where you can't you can't divide people and succeed in business. You can't break down trust with one group in order to embolden your own side and expect to succeed in business. So I, I'm just wondering if you've ever had that thought, you know, where are the leader, where is the leaders going to come that are, you know, yeah, there's a book that was written fourth turning. I don't want to go into it, but they talk about we repeat history. We go through these four turnings and we're now in this turning of crisis, like we were in World War II and the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. And it's it's one of those times that humanity's got to pull themselves up and figure out how to reconvene in a more uh, effective way. Right. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's kind of an out of the box question. But given everything we've talked about and what your thoughts are and if that is that a relevant uh, possibility or just your thoughts on that well i i will tell you that um when i when i left prologis the first thing that somebody asked me is would you go into politics and i was only <laughs> i was the ripe old age of 55 
And um, I believe strongly in leadership. And I actually believe strongly in my ability to lead. Um, but, but I have to tell you, I decided not to do it for various reasons. Um, not the least of which is just overall exposure, my family being exposed. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, it's a mess. And, going through that. and, and, you know, you might say that that's, that's being a coward. I don't know, but um, I was just concerned about it. And I, I hope that as a society, we can get to a point where business leaders um, feel good about retiring early and um, and taking you know significant positions in politics because I do believe that um, we would be a better country if we did. Um, and yeah. and now I know. Don't get me wrong. There's a number of people in Congress that do have business backgrounds, and so I'm not trying to um, make them out to be politicians only. But I do right. think that um, there's a number of people that will not want to do that um, because unfortunately it's just so divided and it's mm -hmm. divisive um, and and it's so divisive and divided that we've lost um, some sense of professionalism I think and and so that that bothers me and quite frankly David I'm not really sure I do think that things change crises change things and maybe we need a crisis in the country to well, yeah, you know, you talk about the crucible. We're, you know, I think everybody feels like we're approaching that. I mean, I, I, unless something miracle happens or we somebody shows up as that kind of leader that pulls us together, yeah. it's like, what is it about needing crucible moments? But humans seem to need crucible moments to rediscover their brilliance. Yes. And when we when we have it all going for us, somehow we start losing our awareness. Mm -hmm. And we get more on autopilot and then become more expected or more focused on ourselves, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, I, and, I don't and that. yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I mean, this has been a great conversation. So one of the things, you know, I think it points to is, you know, you know, how do you get anything you want to say about or suggestions to other executives out there that might be saying, well, how do I get around that issue of my own pride and fear? that I might have gotten in touch with during the podcast or or may realize that sometimes we look at those gremlins and they seemed really big to us. Like I just seem to I might see myself as a good human being, but then I do that. And it's not necessarily it's coming from pride or it's coming from fear and almost like I can't help myself. What do you what do you say to a leader like that and what they can do to begin to address those gremlins in a way that will help them grow into more of a transformational leader? You know, I would say the first and, and the most important thing that comes to my mind is accountability group um, or, or, mm. or a coach, um, somebody that can hold you accountable. I, I think you need information. I don't, I don't think you can manage in a, in a bag, a paper bag, um, or manage in a box, whatever, however you'd say. I think you got to reach out to as many people as you can and grab advice, be open to advice. So not only do I think you should be talking to other C-level executives, but I think it's important to perhaps have a, an accountability group of gray-haired people that surround you and have lived through it and can uh, help you in, in your experiences. Um, you cannot be afraid to listen. Um, open your ears up and listen. I had a coach um, during the entire time that I, I ran the company, and it was a person that um, not only talked to me, but did 360 degree interviews of people, everybody that worked for me. And in fact, our entire management team um, was coached. And um, in doing that, he, he walked into a room one time and told me, Walt, let me tell you the good news and the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that everybody likes working for you. He said, the bad news is that um, you are running around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to solve all the problems in this company. And he said, the problem is nobody feels comfortable knocking on your door and walking in and talking to you because you're too damn busy. He said, you got to right. you got to get out of your own way and, and you're not the one to save this company. And he had to remind me of the very thing that I knew. And, and so I think it's important that you have coaching in your lives if you can afford it and if you're in a position to do it. Otherwise, do it in an accountability group. Ask people. Ask your employer, you know, can can I get a, a, a an understanding of what other people think of me? Uh, you know, and be open to that. If you are, you'll be a better leader. You can't yeah. manage in a box is my point. 
Right. I want to follow up on something else you said, and then I want to give you some final, if you have any final comments. But one of the things you said is I was wording around trying to attend everything and I was too busy. And I see a lot. I actually, one of the challenges I coach when I come across a really good leader, somebody that's already blossomed into the understanding you have around servant leadership and really taking care of their team is sometimes they are running around, you know, not not necessarily focusing on the not important, not urgent things or the urgent important things like taking care of their team because they don't have time. Any thoughts you have? I mean, it's a it's a big question to kind of try to synopsis. But if you say like one or two things you have to do when you realize you're too busy and you're doing too much, how do you how do you parse that out? I just I, I don't know. The first thing that comes to my mind is get advice. Get um, advice. You know, yeah. you're, you're you, you know, intuitively your issue, although I will tell you it's a natural thing. I mean, look, I, it is a natural thing. It's you know, well, it's because you, because if you you have a true leader, they care. So so they're more maybe involved in certain details that, you know, it's 80 20 wool. These details that I'm paying attention to may not be having a big bang for their buck or whatever. And you have to you do have to parse that out. And it's a very individual thing about what you pay attention to or don't attention pay attention to versus somebody else. But yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's what that's what comes to mind. But um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Yeah, great. Well, anything else you want to say that you feel you didn't say to feel complete today as far as I really appreciate you having you on and it's a, it was a great, uh, a great conversation. And I just want to see if there's anything else you wanted to share. Well, I, I'm just, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be on. And um, I would just say that um, leadership is a privilege and an honor. And, and you should think about it that way. Um, leadership is not something that uh, because you're good, you're there uh, for, and, and, and it's people are giving you accolades. No, people put you into that position because now they actually believe that you know how to manage a flock. And managing a flock is not managing yourself. It's managing all these other people. Um, leadership has a greater degree of responsibility outside of yourself than you've ever had in your life. Right. And if you're willing to do that, great. But if you're not, and you know that you're that kind of, you're, you're a, I don't know, let's just say a transactional person or you're a person that has to have gratitude and making the deal and getting, you know, getting yeah, all the, uh, the accolades. And you're probably not going to be a good, good leader. <laughs> Just stay, stay in your sweet spot. Yeah, stay, stay in your, your sweet, sweet spot. spot. Yeah. Right, don't, right. don't worry about the promotion. Stay where you are because you will not be happy at the end of the day. You will not be successful unless you can get out of your own way. Yeah. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree. Well, it's a real privilege and an honor to be a leader. You're touching people's lives. You know, I had one leader say, if I have my people go home and they have space and time to be with their family, I've done their, done my job. You know, part of what I've done is done my job. But they don't go home and kick the cat. You know, <laughs> they're going home. They're going home with a little less stress. So well, yeah. anyway, I really I really appreciate the the time you, you took to be with me today. It's a real honor and privilege to have you on our show. And I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in today to this incredible rich conversation. I hope that I'm looking forward to having more conversations like this and Unfazed Under Fire. And again, thank you very much for taking the time to watch today. Have a great rest of your day. I'm David Craig Utz, the Resilient Leadership Guy, signing off. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Take care. Take care.